Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And if anyone wants to move forward, please feel free to do so. It looks like everybody's so far back today. You don't have to, but uh, you don't have to be all the way by the back door. I like the size of our uh, auditorium space here today because the back row is like the front row in a lot of churches. And so you don't have to worry about being disconnected. And I'm so grateful for you guys being here today. And I'm looking forward to what we're going to learn in the scriptures. So let's go ahead and look at, if you will, in your copy of the scripture down to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And we'll begin in verse 1 with the word dare. Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to the law before the unjust and not before the saints. Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. But brother goeth to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. Now, there's utter, now therefore there is utterly a fault among you, because ye go to law one with another. Why do ye not rather take wrong? Why do ye not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Yea, ye do wrong and defraud, and that your brethren will pray. Heavenly Father, thank you this morning for express, explicitly written commands in Scripture. And Lord, I acknowledge this morning before I preach this message that without your Spirit, these commands are too hard for us. But we do recognize this morning, God, that your way is not only always best, but Father, that your way works. And I ask that you would just teach us, instruct us from your word today. Father, it's my heart's desire that if there would be a particular matter that a Christian would have with another Christian, that they would find answers in the Scripture. And Lord, rather than questioning your ways, they would just obey and find out how that you are able to work and bless. We praise your name for what you'll do. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. We're in a portion of Scripture that is uh, really in a letter that is constant correction. The letter, the first letter to the church at Corinth is all about no, 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 you're doing it wrong. And it really, if you say, Pastor, it really seems like 1 Corinthians is a lot of negativity. Well, there's a lot of problems in the church. And I want to tell you something. Problems are negative and solutions are positive. And the letter to the church at Corinth was for the purpose of fixing a lot of problems. And we've seen several of those already in the text. The first problem that was causing division in the church. By the way, is division in the church a good thing? Does it help, <coughs> excuse me, does it help the cause of Christ? Does it help promote the gospel? Does it persuade the world that Jesus is a better way? No, friend. Division among believers damages the cause of the gospel. It destroys the effectiveness of the bride of Christ, the church, and it renders those that are saved, uh, it renders them in incapable to carry out their calling in God's life. And not only that, but friend, when we're in sin, we're miserable. And so when, uh, when there's problems in the church, there's misery that comes as a consequence or as a result of it. I want to remind you about something today, and, and the, what I want to remind you of this morning is that it is a good thing to be shown the problems in your life. When I go to the doctor, and I, uh, I went to a doctor, let's see, what would have been uh, 11 years ago? Uh, that was the first time in probably 20 years. Uh, I went to a doctor 11 years ago, and I didn't have a very good doctor. I had uh, destroyed this wrist, and it probably looks better now than it did then, but it was, it was crooked, and, and it was swollen up, you know, really large here, and I, didn't go in this, I don't want to go in the story of how I did that, but I've done a lot of things like that. It was working with, uh, it, was, it had to do with teenagers. Anyway, so I destroyed this wrist, and it had been bad for a while, and I had health insurance at the time, and so I thought, well, I'll go to the doctor. So I went to the doctor, and I had a couple of couple of things that I wanted to ask a doctor about. The doctor is coming in a room, and he's probably from, uh, from me to Brother Chuck in the front door, and he's just coming in. He's, he's just glanced at me when he walked in the room, turned his back, and he's writing notes. And he's like, what are you here for? Da, da, da. I said, well, you know, I, I'd like to have my arm looked at because I think it's broken. And he looks this way, 
at me and he says, it doesn't look broken. And goes back uh, to writing, I want to tell you something. I was having pain. And I had had for a while. And uh, I'll be honest with you, it lo did look broken regardless of what. It still looks broken today. If you compare my wrist, this one looked broken. And let me just tell you something. I didn't go back to that doctor. Why? Because he wouldn't tell me. I mean, I wanted to know how to get it fixed. I wanted him to say it's broken and it needs to be fixed. He just told me from across the room it doesn't look broken. I thought, well, that's all the discussion we're going to have about this because you can't help me. You know, sometimes with regard to our problems of sin in our lives, we want somebody that tells us we don't have a problem. And what we would prefer would be to have somebody that say, looks fine to me. And I want to tell you something that won't fix your problem. And if your problem is sin, the best thing in the world that you can have is a diagnosis of sin. To say, here's the problem. Hey, you say, Pastor, what good does it do to point out a problem? Friend, when you recognize that you've got a problem, you're that much closer to a solution for the problem. And when your problem is sin, there's always a solution. I want to say that again. I want you to get that this morning. When your problem is sin, there's always a solution. You say, Pastor, sometimes it's a hard solution. Yes, friend, it's a very hard solution. It's very costly. And it may cost you personally, but I promise you, it is not nearly as costly to you, the solution for your sin, as the cost that Jesus Christ paid when He became sin, when He was the righteous Son of God for you. Let me pause here a moment and talk about Jesus and the solution for sin ultimately. Friend, you and I know what the Bible says is true about sin, don't we? All have sinned, come short of the glory of God, and that's true for you and it's true for me. Uh, I don't uh, concern myself with whether folks will be offended at my calling them a sinner because you know what your sin is. I don't know what your sin is. I just know what mine is. I, I mean, I may know some of the sin that, that you commit overtly, blatantly, and so forth. But if I don't know about it, it doesn't matter. You do, God does. And you know that you've got conviction for sin. The Bible says all have sinned come short of the glory of God. There's not an exception to that. There's not a almost everyone except for the person sitting in your seat have sinned. No, friend, it's all have sinned. And because you're a sinner, you can understand and know that everyone else is as well. The Bible says as well, the wages of sin is death. And it is important for us to understand that our sin is not inconsequential. It matters that we sin. Uh, the world today tries to tell us that even though you feel guilty after sin, even though, uh, even though uh, it may cause consequences after you sin, the world tries to tell us that the only problem with sin is that people say it's wrong. I'll tell you, the world today tries to say that everything that is wicked is good. And the trouble with it is that it's not so. The world says drinking is good. Friend, we have commercials on television that try to say drinking is good. We have police officers that stop people for DUI checks that go home and drink. I remember one time getting stopped in Kansas for a DUI check, and I don't want to talk about DUI checks, but there was it was uh, coming into town, and they were there was a checkpoint. I didn't know it was going to be there. I was driving home, and I'm driving my little pickup, and I got stopped. And a man said, the police officer said, you had anything to drink tonight? I said, sir, I've never had anything to drink in my life. I've never drank alcohol. And he laughed, and he thought it was funny. And I said, no, I'm not making a joke. I'm telling you, I've never drank. And and. And he's like, yeah, sure, whatever. And it kind of offended me. It bothered me just a little bit that the man just didn't believe that I'd never drank. And the fact of the matter is I hate the stuff because uh, I've seen what it does to people. I told our teenagers in Sunday school this morning, the Bible says wine's a mocker, strong drink is raging, whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. So if you think it's okay, the Bible has a polite way of calling you a fool. Uh, if you think that there's no consequence, there's no problem with drinking. But uh, more than that, I've been around it enough to see women that are abused. I've seen children that are neglected. And I've seen individuals destroy themselves. They've destroyed their relationship with their friends and their family and all those things. And the world says it's okay. Uh, the police officer says there's nothing wrong with drinking. Just drink responsibly. How do you, do, how do you poison yourself responsibly? I mean, it's, it's nonsense if you really think about it. But the world spends all kind of time telling you it's okay as long as you have a designated driver. It's okay as long as you only hurt yourself and you don't hurt anyone else. But the Bible says that our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost and the Spirit of God dwelleth in us. And so, friend, I want to say to you, the Bible says it's sin, then it is, period. Uh, the world does that about everything. The world says there's no consequence for living in adultery. It doesn't cause problems. It doesn't cause relationship issues. It's, everybody does it. It's normal. It's natural. It's healthy. And it's fine. And it, uh, it ignores the fact that no kid grows up in a, in a home like that without having major dysfunction. It, 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 it ignores the fact that you die 
uh, that you go into your old age without ever having anyone ever commit to a relationship with you. And, you, and even though you've had somebody, you're alone, you're lonely. It, you, you, it, it ignores the fact uh, that you uh, have all kinds of physical issues that have that happen as a result. It ignores the fact that it flies in the face of what the Word of God says, and the world says it's okay. They say the same thing about homosexuality. Remember the three words, normal, natural, healthy. Normal, natural, and healthy. Friend, if you ever worked in a hospital, you know it's not healthy. Friend, if you ever dealt with somebody that has issues of insecurity and rage and, and a, a, a stricken conscience and they're miserable on a constant basis, you ever a police officer uh, calling on a domestic quote-unquote violent situation in a homosexual home, you know it's not natural, it's not healthy. Uh, if you ever talk to somebody that's struggling with that sin, you'll find out it's not normal, it's not something, if it was normal, everybody would be okay living in that kind of a lifestyle. But friend, it's not. The problem is it's sin. And the world can say it's all right, but it's not. And no person that will not knowledge of sin will ever be helped. And I just want to say to you this morning that one of the best things in the world is for God's Word to show us ourselves in the light of the Scripture and to convince and to convict us of sin because then you're in the place where you're going to be able to have help. All sin to come to short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God's eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And the Bible says specifically that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I just want to put it as succinctly as I can. Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. He was born in answer. Uh, he was born as, as a fulfillment of every prophecy of a Messiah, of a Savior. He was born sinless. He was born of the seed of a woman and not the seed of a man because sin is passed down through the seed of a man. He was born of a virgin. He never sinned. He lived a life that was sinless, had hundreds of thousands of witnesses. He had the power of God in his life. He had proof. Nicodemus came and said, Master, Rabbi, we know that our teacher come from God, for no man can do the miracles I do us except God be with him. So he performed the supernatural. He raised individuals from the dead. He healed people who had never who'd been lame and never walked. He gave the, he healed the deaf who had never heard. He healed the blind. He fed multitudes. And more than that, the greater thing that Jesus did, greater than all of the miracles that he did, was the fact that he had the power on earth to forgive sins. And he forgave sins. And uh, my friend, that is the greatest power of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is the ability to forgive sins. How is it that Jesus is able to forgive sins? Friend, because he was sinless. And he was God. And he was the one who is the righteous judge of sin. Had the right to condemn sin in the flesh. Had the right uh, to destroy the sinner. And Jesus, my friend, went to the cross for sin. But it was not his sin he died on the cross for. It was your sin. And it was my sin. Did I say to you a minute ago that it's a good thing to know about sin so we can get help? Friend, the help for your sin is the fact that Jesus Christ took your penalty. He took your place. He took your punishment. And he died in your place. And the Bible says, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Saved from what? Not saved from this life, my friend. Saved from the wrath of God that is coming to you as a consequence of sin that you have committed against God. And when you call on the name of the Lord, God takes the righteousness, the perfect life, the sinlessness of Jesus, and places His righteous, perfect blood. He covers and cleanses you from all sin. So He places the blood of Jesus on you and places your sin on Jesus Christ and nails it in the law that condemns you for sin to the cross. And I want to tell you something. There's not a sin in the world so atrocious. There's not a sin in the world so exceptional, so terrible, that you cannot receive the righteousness of Jesus Christ for the asking. And friend, if you're here this morning, can I comfort you by giving you the promise of the Scripture that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved? If you've come here this morning and you've never received Jesus as your Savior, that's your need. That's what you need this morning. But now we find that there is a group of individuals in Corinth, the church at Corinth, and this letter is written to them because they've been saved from sin. They're believers in Jesus Christ, and they've got sin in the church. So they've been saved. They have eternal life through Jesus Christ, but they're living in sin. There's division in the church, first of all, because people were following men instead of Jesus. Inadvertently, we look to those whom we admire, I don't know what it is about man. I believe it's because man was created to worship God. But many times men like to misplace worship. Men like to misplace worship. Who's worthy of our worship? God is. He's the greatest. He's the wisest. He's the most powerful. He's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. Uh, he, is, he is worthy to be worshipped. But many times man wants to worship something 
lower than God. And there's a lot of reasons for it. Romans chapter 1 says it's because we don't like to retain God in our knowledge. In other words, we don't want to bow to God. And so many times we'll look to a man instead of God. And in the church of Corinth, they looked to notable men and they were following them. Some people said, I'm of Paul. So they were following Paul who wrote this letter to rebuke them for following him. Some people said, I'm of Apollos. So hey, we follow Barnabas. Uh, some people said, I'm of Cephas. I'm a follower of Peter. And other people said, I'm of Christ. And Paul rebuked the church because they were following men instead of Jesus Christ. He said, there's a lack of unity. And he said, you're carnal. You're not spiritual because you're following men instead of Jesus. And Paul's conclusion, he, uh, we, we, saw, we, we went through several weeks of the, what the scripture had to say. But Paul's conclusion was that if you look at men, the most accomplished men are nothing. Paul put it this way. He said, not many mighty, not many noble, not many wise. He said, wise first, are called. In other words, God hasn't used smart guys. He hasn't used powerful guys, influential guys. He hasn't used strong guys. He, hasn't, he doesn't use the strong. Those aren't the people that God does great things with. But the Bible says, God hath chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. When I read that verse, I think, thank you, Lord, for using the foolish things of this world because I know personally who the Bible's talking about when it talks about the foolish. God hath chosen the weak. God, I have no strength without your strength. God hath chosen, uh, he has chosen the things which are nothing to bring to nothing things that are. And the reason for it is that no flesh should glory in his presence. God is not going to go to heaven and say, wow, you know, I really look up to brother so-and-so because, man, when I saved him, I had no idea the bargain I was getting. No, friend, when God saves you, he gets a sinner. And you get his righteousness. And trust me, you got the bargain, not God. When God saved you, he gave you power that you needed to become the son of God. But you didn't give him anything. But now we're talking about the Christian life and how we should live. And I want to submit to you this morning, not only is it a good thing when we have our sin revealed to us, but it's a good thing as well when we receive instruction on how to live. How do you live? Well, you could go down, you could just walk out of this building and you could just go and sit on the bus bench and um, intercept people that are walking up and down the sidewalk and ask them what the purpose of life is and how they should live. And you will, as many people as you speak to, you'll get that many different answers about what life's about and what the purpose of life is. And friend, I want to tell you something without Jesus, you don't know what life's about. You know what your purpose is, but we have a calling in Christ Jesus. And so only those that know Jesus have got a purpose. One of the purposes of a Christian life is to be holy and blameless before Him in love. And that's one of the things we're addressing. Now, we're, last week we talked about, last couple of weeks, we talked in, about uh, gross sin in the church. The specific sin that was committed was one that was so wicked that individuals that weren't Christian said it was wicked. In other words, the Bible said it's not named among the Gentiles. Words, even the Gentiles weren't doing what this man in the church was doing, and he was saved. A saved man, what had he done? He'd taken his father's wife. You say, oh, Pastor, that's terrible. Well, that's exactly what the lost people said as well. But the rebuke to the church was you're puffed up and you're prideful because you haven't done anything about it. You have not confronted the matter, the situation, and uh, you've just, you haven't mourned for this man and because you know that judgment's coming on him and the consequence of it is that there's going to be judgment on you. And then Paul gave them the command. He said, if you won't, put him out, if you won't turn him out of the church because of sin, then God's judgment's going to come, and then when I come, I'm going to deal with him as well. He said, you've puffed up. And then last week we looked at leaven, and we looked at how that a little bit of leaven leavens the whole lump. Now, um, in verse chapter 6 now, now, the final command for this wicked person, by the way, and it's always good to qualify it, the final command in chapter 5 and verse 13 was to put away from you this wicked person. Of course, put him out of the church because God is going to judge the church. He, he, he's going to judge. The church is a place of God's blessing. And God is going to have to judge the whole church if you don't put this man outside of the church. And so we saw some things that had to do with God's judgment. I, I would uh, I encourage you if, you, if you're wanting to study this in particular, study 1 Thessalonians when it talks about uh, dealing with sin in the church as well. And understand the purpose of dealing with with sin in the church because it gives a lot of balance in it and it has the purpose of admonishing this the person so that they get back and get right. And if you read the second letter to the Corinthians uh, that's inspired and in our Bible, the, the, the letter to Corinthians, Paul writes the church and says, restore such a person because he's sorrowed, he's gotten right for his sin. And we find that this man who is in the church and who's being destroyed by sin was church discipline. He was put outside of the church 
And the consequence of it was that he had sorrow for his sin and he got right, and then he was restored into perfect fellowship with Christ and with his church. And that is the purpose of church discipline, is for people to get right with the Lord. Okay, now we're into a separate matter. This is the third matter that's addressed in 1 Corinthians that's causing division in the church. Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law, uh, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints. Specifically, what had happened was that there were individuals in the church who had dared, as the scripture had put it, they'd had the audacity, they'd had the nerve to take each other to a law of unjust judges. What does that mean? It means they took each other to court. Uh, two Christians in the church, evidently, in particular, at least one of them, maybe both of them were somewhat wrong, but one of them was wrong, and to get the matter settled, they went and uh, they, they, they dealt with it legally before an unjust judge. Now let me just say it to you this morning. The Word of God very plainly shows that God gives authority to the government. And it gives the government the authority to judge, to, to prosecute, to imprison, and even to put to death. You find that the scripture very expressly gives the government authority. This is not an, un, an anti-government, anti-authority passage of scripture. This is a testimony issue that the church is having. And so I want to make, I'll make some distinctions as we move through our material. But what had happened was evidently someone in the church took advantage of someone else. Either they borrowed something and didn't repay it, or they tricked or fooled someone in the church and defrauded them, took advantage of them. I hate to say this, but there are individuals, and I don't, I don't know whether they're saved or not, but there are individuals that come in the church for the purpose of defrauding. Uh, <laughs> Multi-level marketing. Multi-level marketers love to come in the church and get contacts and get what they can and then go to another place and do the same thing. I don't want to pick on multi-level marketing too much this morning. I'll pick on it another time. But it, it, is, the, it is designed uh, to... Now it, the Multi-level marketing appeals to greed. It appeals to covetousness. It appeals to the desire to become rich without the work that it takes to do it. And the Bible says, They that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. I don't know what happened. Maybe Brother Smith borrowed Brother Jones's uh, donkeys and uh, didn't give them back and then claimed later on that Brother uh, Smith had given him the donkeys and he took advantage. I don't know what the situation was. Maybe there were multiple situations. But Paul through the inspiration of God's Spirit, very plainly gives some commands to the church on how to behave. And can I say to you that because this is the inspired Word of God, that the truth that was for the church at Corinth is the truth that is for the church in Fort Lauderdale, Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church. And so there are Bible instructions, Bible commands, on how brothers in Christ are to resolve matters with themselves. The first accusation that Paul makes is that they have gone before an unjust judge. Now this does not mean that the judge is not fair. Simply what it is saying is that an individual who is a saint, how do we become a saint? You receive Jesus Christ in his righteousness, and saint is a hagios or a holy one. When you're saved positionally in Jesus Christ, you are just or justified, therefore you are a holy one, you're a saint. You're not a saint because of your behavior. You're not a saint because of your response to Jesus Christ for salvation. You are a saint because God has given you the righteousness of Jesus. And you've been justified, so you're just. And I'll say to you this morning that as many individuals in this room has received, have received Jesus as their Savior, that's how many saints we have at Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church today. So a saint is not someone that some organization has determined after their death that they live such a holy life that they are going to receive sainthood. Uh, no, friend, a saint is someone who, because Jesus Christ lived a holy life, have received His righteousness, and that is anyone who has ever been saved. So the contrast here is not between an unfair judge. This is a contrast be somebody, between somebody who has not justified themselves, or they're lost. And so we have the world's view, the world's system, and we have Christians that are in the church who have been justified, who have been given two commands. What are the commands for a Christian in the church? Two specific commands. Two things that, that, that are thou shalt in the church. What's the first one? Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul and all thy mind. What's the second command? Love thy neighbor as thyself. 
Okay, so now here's Brother Smith, and over here is Brother Jones, and uh, Brother Smith has defrauded Brother Jones. Now, Brother Jones says, Brother Smith, you better give him back my donkeys or whatever it is, uh, or I'm going to take you to court. And uh, I forget which one's which. Brother Jones over there? Yeah. Whoever it is. Well, anyway, so Brother Smith says, you go ahead and take me to court. I've got a good case. You can't prove they're your donkeys. I branded them. They got my name on them. Whatever it is. And it's possession is nine-tenths of the law or gives him some kind of garbage like that. And so he made him mad, whichever one. I don't know if that's Jones or Smith over there, Jones. Anyway, Smith got mad, and he sued Jones. Went to court, and here are two guys. Hey, who, who are you fellas? Well, we were in church. They, they start to present their case. Well, we were in church, and I had a piece of untilled ground, and I mentioned to Brother Smith that I could sure use some, some of the donkeys that he had, and he offered to... Where were you at? You are in church. Oh, are you Christians? Yes. So I was just trying to be charitable and love my brother, and he ripped me off. I said, boy, that church got some problems over there. We already heard about the man that took his father's wife. You know what they just did? They just showed an unjust judge that Christians don't love God, don't love each other. It's a major problem. Oh, by the way, judge, oh, why don't you come to our church? <laughs> why don't you come visit us? Yeah, sure, yeah. You know, why don't you become a Christian, be like Jesus? Oh, yeah, I want to be just like you guys. See, this unjust judge is a better man than either of these guys. They can't even get along with each other, and they're justified. Here's a man that is going to go to hell because he's a sinner. And before him are standing two individuals that are going to heaven because they have the righteousness of Jesus. And this man has got it more together with his behavior than two individuals that are permanently justified and have eternal life. And if that's not a major confusing contradiction that would cause people to reject Jesus as their Savior, I don't know what will. Friend, I want to tell you something. You may not believe in it, but there is such a thing as blood guiltiness. There is such a thing as an individual having a testimony that would cause the name of Jesus Christ to be despised. And not because individuals don't want to bow to Him, but because of the behavior of individuals that say, oh, we're model Christians. So Brother Smith's a model Christian, Brother Jones is a model Christian, they're in court together. And they're making Christians look like fools. And they're making it look as though when God saves you, it doesn't do anything in the life of a believer. Christian, I want to stop a minute. I want to say to you, you better be careful about your testimony. You may not think it's a big deal, but the Bible says in Romans that no man liveth unto himself, and no man dieth unto himself. And I want to say to you that the way you live and the way that you die, the way that you behave, will cause people either to come to Jesus Christ, or it will cause them to be repulsed from the gospel and burn forever in hell. And you may not think that's a big deal, but God's word does. And we'll stand before God. We'll answer for the things that are done in this body. For our works, whether they're works of righteousness or whether they're sin. You say, Pastor, you're trying to give me a guilt trip this morning. No, friend, I'm just telling you what the Bible teaches. I can show you that from the Word of God. And it's important. So here's a testimony of Christ that's been dragged through the mud at this church. Can you imagine? Well, I mean, everybody knows about the church. And let me, let me just uh, mention something else um, that we're going to see in this passage of Scripture. And that is that church business is church business. Church business is church business. Hey, listen, what kind of people does God save? You answer me. Sinners. So what kind of people are in the church? Sinners. And that's to be expected. I'm not surprised when somebody comes in the church and they're sin. Are you? No, friend. The reason we got saved is because we needed to be. I'm not going to say it's natural. I'm not going to say it's normal for there to be sinners in the church. But friend, that's the kind of people God saves. And as they're being sanctified, as they're learning to be holy as He's holy, there's going to be sin. It's not a problem when a sinner gets saved and is learning how to have victory. It's a problem when the church can't deal with sin. So there's a big difference between a church that has sinners in it and is dealing with sin, that's judging itself, and a church that has sin in it and is doing nothing about it. You see the difference? Now, I want to say this to you as well. If you hang around the people in our church, you're going to find out that there's some sin. And if you find out about it, you ought to do something about it. You ought to open the Word of God. You ought to show them what the Word of God is, and you ought to give them accountability. You ought to say, Brother, I'm praying for you to do right, and I'll do anything in my power to help you do right. You ought to help them. You ought to ask them. You ought to say, Hey, you've got to get right. You can't live like this. You ought to challenge them. But one of the things you ought to do is talk to your neighbor about them. 
I've heard, I don't know, I've never had it happen in our church, so I was just talking about it so the so Lord willing it doesn't happen. I've heard stories from lost people about saved people. And you just wonder, what in the world is somebody telling that to someone else for that doesn't even know Christ? Is it going to help them get saved? Boy, I'll tell you something. I'd invite you to my church, but ah, uh, boy, I'll tell you. Uh, man, they're just sister so-and-so. You know what she did to me? And you tell them about sister so-and-so in the church, and that person thinks, I never want to go to your church. Hey, friend, maybe you ought to deal with sin in the church instead of talking about sin in the church to the lost. If there's sin in the church, friend, it ought to be dealt with in the church, but it ought to be spread to the lost. And that's exactly what's happened. Here's Brother Smith and Brother Jones, and they're airing the laundry. Are there going to be, are there bound to be, because you've got sinners together, are there bound to be disagreements sometimes? Are there bound to be issues that come up sometime? Friend, yes, there most certainly will, but if you have are demonstrating the fruits of the Spirit, you'll be able to deal with sin. And when you deal with sin the right way, the biblical way, people get right, they get in fellowship, and I want to tell you something, it's not something to talk about. It just gets taken care of. That's the attitude, but this church is taking care they're taking each other to court. There's, you got your right wing and your left wing. You got the Smiths and the Joneses. There's a feud in the church and they're going before an unjust judge. Okay, now, here's the argument that's made first of all. Here's a do ye not know. In other words, when you say don't you know, what you're saying is, duh. Guys, come on, this, is this not simple? Okay, now here's the do you not know statement. Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? Okay. You remember the question, uh, was it uh, Peter and John, uh, their mother asked, no, no, it's James and, it was James and John. The mother of James and John asked Jesus the question, when you rule on earth, Jesus, can my son sit on your right hand and on your left hand? Remember that question? Okay, Did J James and John understood that the time was going to come when they would reign with Christ. And by the way, we'll all reign with Jesus Christ. I want to tell you something, you better be, you better be growing up you, as a Christian. You better be mature and you better learn how to rule in a godly, righteous way because you're in training right now for the time that we rule the world. And I'm not talking about conquering this world of sin. I'm talking about when Jesus Christ comes and He conquers the world. He's going to set us up and we're going to reign with Him. And you have a very practical position you need to be preparing for right now. Let me ask you a question. Are you ready to reign with Jesus? Are you learning about justice? Are you learning about righteousness? Are you learning about judgment? If there's one place where people ought to know about justice, about right, and about how to make things right, it ought to be the church. And the question is, are you going to rule, are you going to reign with Jesus someday? And the answer to the question is, yes. You going to judge the world? Yes. Okay. If the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Okay. This is just a duh statement. I love it. It uses sarcasm. Sarcasm is one of my favorite tools, and I'm constantly criticized for being sarcastic. Uh, I, I, I shouldn't say that. I'm constantly offensive because of my sarcasm, so I just love it when there's inspired con uh, sarcasm in the Scripture. And the question is, are you going to rule the world and you can't take care of Mr. Smith and Mr. Jones and their stupid mules? or whatever it is, donkeys, or money, or whatever the issue is. Because you're going to rule the world, and you can't figure out how to settle a matter in the church? Now here's another sarcastic statement that's made. Know you not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? Now let me ask you a question. Scripturally, are we above or below the angels right now? We're below. We're a little lower than the angels. Psalm chapter 8, verse 5. Hebrews chapter 2, uh, verses 7 through 9, and so forth. But the day is going to come when angels are simply messengers. They're simply servants of God. And the day is going to become when we're going to be the adopted children of God, the sons of God, ruling the world, and we're going to even judge angels. And if we're going to judge angels, do you think we can care, take care of Mr. Smith and Mr. Jones? See... I mean, well, folks, you're preparing to be with Jesus Christ. You're preparing to rule and to reign with Him. And don't you think you need to be stepping up your behavior just a little bit as a response? I'm telling you, Christians don't even know how to get along with each other. Shame on you. If you can't even figure out how to get along with your brother or sister in Christ, and we're given two ways to get along, 
and we'll see it, and then uh, we'll be done before you know it, I'm sorry to say. Okay, in verse 4, then the question is, If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are the least esteemed in the church. Okay. You got somebody in the church, and people don't think he's very bright. You got somebody in the church, and people don't think he's very successful. Who would like to volunteer today? I need, I need a volunteer. Brother Chris, thank you. Come up here. <laughs> uh, you wouldn't want to compete with Chris in any kind of an exam because he'd probably accidentally get a better score than you no matter what. So sit down, Brother Chris. We're going to put you in the judgment seat. Okay, but we're going to, we're going to recreate Chris as somebody that he's not. And because he's got a good spirit about him, he won't be offended by it. So, Brother Chris, we're going to make you feeble-minded today. You say, okay. 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 So, Brother Chris has got a good spirit about him. He's feeble-minded. What I mean by that is he's, he's, um, he struggles having average capacity. He's not quite average. Okay. Now, uh, okay, so he's less than average mentally. Yeah, I'm not being mean, but this is just Brother Chris. And he's, he's saved. He's a saint. He's got the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And get this. Uh, St. Chris is going to rule the world someday with Jesus, and this is no joke. Okay? So he's a little less than most mentally. Okay? And um, he's a little less accomplished because he's a little less up here. He's a little less accomplished than anyone else. Let's give him a job. What's a good job for somebody that, that uh, can't handle a lot of responsibility? Clean the bathroom. Clean the bathroom? No. No, I want somebody, I want somebody <laughs> responsible for that. <laughs> well, let's give him a job. What's his job? Let's make him the greeter. He'll be the Walmart greeter, okay, but he'll be the Fort Lauderdale Baptist greeter. Okay, so his job is to say, hi, how are you today, and try to get a bulletin to every person that comes in the door, but he usually fails at that, even though that's his job. Okay, so he's not a major success in the job that he's been given. So this is Brother Chris. He's a little less than most as far as his intellect goes. Got a good spirit about him, but he's not the smartest guy in the world. And Brother Smith and Brother Jones, each of them think that they've got a pretty good case for why the donkeys are theirs. Now get what Paul says to the church at Corinth. He said, is there not someone, uh, he says, if you're going to, rather than go to an unjust judge, he said, set them who are not esteemed, or are the least esteemed in the church. So here's Brother Chris, and uh, here's Brother Smith and Brother Jones, and uh, they're going to come to court. So here, uh, you be Brother Smith for me. Try to be Brother Jones. Just point the camera over here. Okay, so here's Brother, you can be Brother Smith. If you guys remember this, Brother Smith, try to come here. Okay. <laughs> Um, and you be Brother Jones, okay? Come over here. Stand right here, okay? <laughs> Brother Smith and Brother Jones have got a complicated situation, and uh, they it's complex, so complex that they can't resolve it among themselves. Both of them think they've got a case, and they come to uh, Brother Chris, and they're angry with each other. Now, remember about Brother Chris, there's one thing that, that is a positive. It's not his intellect. It's not his accomplishment. But the positive thing is he loves the Lord. The positive thing is that he's saved, and the thing we got to remember is someday Brother Chris is going to judge the world. Okay? So he's got qualifications. In other words, here's the first statement that's made in that contradiction. I've set them that are the least esteemed. If he's saved, he's going to rule and reign with Jesus Christ. So he's qualified to judge. He may not be the brightest bulb in the shed, but he's qualified to judge because he's going to do it for a thousand years with Jesus. So he's already got the qualification. What's his qualification? The righteousness of Jesus Christ. Brother Smith, Brother Jones can't get along. One of them has wronged each other. They probably both wronged each other. Uh, Brother Smith, man, he took Brother Jones' mules, but Brother Jones insulted Brother Smith and called him things that a Christian ought to call each other. And Brother Chris is here, and uh, they come to Brother Chris and they say, would you judge between us? And Brother Chris says, well, first of all, you guys need to love each other. You know what just happened? If these men will receive the authority of God, if they'll obey God's commandment that you love God and you love each other, Brother, Brother Jones says, you know what? I don't care who's right or who's wrong. It, the, you know what? I'll tell you who's wrong. I don't love you like I should, and I'm going to stop it. And he says, Brother, Brother Smith, I love you, and uh, I'll do whatever you want. Brother Smith says, you know, Brother Jones, he says, you know, my problem is I don't love the way I should. And uh, I'm being selfish. And it's all about me and being vindicated and proving that I'm right. And I, instead of this, you know what, I'll just, you can have whatever it is. And if it's not enough, I'll get some more to give you. 
and I'll make it right. Go ahead and sit down, guys. Okay, so now here is an individual that doesn't know all that much, and he just passed a good judgment. His judgment is you're supposed to love each other. Matter of fact, that's what the Bible says the end result of the judgment will be. Look down with me, if you will, in verse 7. Now, therefore, there's utterly, it means completely, there's this, it's just without any question, there's a fault among you because you go to law one with another. Why do you not rather take the wrong? Now, Christian, when you love someone, you know what you'll do first? You'll take a wrong. If you love someone, you'll take it. You may not like it. You may not think it's right, but your major concern, and by the way, we're really self-righteous about this sometimes. Well, I'm just afraid if they get away with it. Aren't you always afraid if they get away with it? I'm just afraid if they get away with it. No, friend, your real concern ought to be I love them. Your real concern ought to be I love them. Hey, let me, let me remind you about something. We don't need to have witch hunt Christians. We don't need to be looking for the things that God's Spirit reveals. Sometimes Christians have the idea of they're doing wrong and I'm going to find out about it. I'm going to catch them in the act and I'm going to prove it and we're going to deal with them. You don't need to do that, Christian. You know, God reveals the things. He reveals things. I mean, He just shows things. Remember Ananias and Sapphira come to Peter and they lie to him about selling the land and giving it all and God just told Peter they're lying. Peter says, Why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? God's Spirit will reveal things. Hey, you're, you're not the Spirit of God, and your job isn't to go and find out. God will find you out. The Bible says your sins will find you out. So our job's not to find sin. Our job's not to diagnose this person's doing this or that. Our job is to love each other. And Brother Chris's major concern with these two guys is these guys don't love each other. I love them both, and they don't love each other, and they're going to be hurt by it because they're not right with the Lord. And then the Bible says the best thing to do is for him to suffer yourself to be defrauded. What if he gets takes advantage of me? He's going to think I'm stupid. He's going to think that I'm just a sucker. He's going to think that I'm just whatever. And Christian, I want to tell you something. Who cares if you love him? See, you know what our problem comes back to again? We think we're more than we are. What are we? We're sinners, we're condemned in sin, we're without hope in Jesus Christ. And when we're saved, we're saved by the grace of God. And if somebody thinks you're nothing, they've pretty much hit the nail on the head. That's just about exactly right. <laughs> He's going to think I'm a nobody. He's going to think he can just walk all over me. If you love him, it'll be true. You know what might happen? He might love you too. One of the problems in the church is that we'd rather have the unjust judge try to vindicate us. We want to be right rather than suffer ourselves to be defrauded. You say, Pastor, that's kind of a hard statement. Okay, what's the standard for it? The Bible teaches very plainly that the government has the right to judge, doesn't it? Romans chapter 13, read it sometime. They have the right to imprison. They have the right to tax. Government has the right to do that. The government has the right to enforce the law. And if there's a person in the church that's broken the law, they've committed a crime, and the, the law says it's a crime, the church doesn't have the right to judge that. Church doesn't have the right to say, uh, and, and by the way, this has happened. It, it's sad to say, but it's happened in the church. Individual has committed a crime against a child. And uh, they try to church discipline him. They cover. They just cover it up in the church. Friend, church doesn't have the right to do that. That's God hasn't given you that authority. Gave you the authority over spiritual things, and now you turn it over to the right judge. So you're not judging that person. You're just turning them over to the right authority. And there's a lot of problems that come from covering up sin in the church. Brother so and so is not paying his taxes. He's done something that's against the law, and uh, you don't have the right to cover him up. You don't have the right to cover for him. You don't get to judge him. That's the job of the law. But I'll tell you what you do have the right to. You have the right to be defrauded personally. You have the right to be taken advantage of. You have the right to be mistreated. You have the right to be defrauded. Not given what is dutifully, right, dutifully rightfully yours. And the judgment is take a wrong. Because someday you're going to judge the world. 
for doing wrong. If you can't judge yourselves. There's a little sarcasm here as well. In other words, Paul is saying by analogy, it is better to be judged by the least in the church than by the wisest in the world. You say, Pastor, this is very costly, this is very expensive. Uh, this, could, this could really cost a great deal. I know of a situation where I just preached this passage of Scripture and a friend of mine was there. And he got defrauded by another Christian. He got taken advantage of for a lot, like $30,000. It was a pretty big deal. And he came to me afterward. He said, Pastor, he said, this guy's a Christian and he's defrauded me. <laughs> I said, what am I going to do? He said, the other guy's a Christian. What should I do? And I said, well, what does the Bible say? He says, yeah, but we're talking about $30,000. And I said, well, what does the Bible say? He says, yeah, we're talking about $30,000. And that individual made a decision he was going to do things the Bible way. He said, all right, I'm going to do right. So what did our brother do? Well, they find, they find the least to judge between them, so they got me. <laughs> and the two men agreed to sit down and have me talk to both of them. And we just laid it out. So I like to hear you say what your side is, and I like to hear you say what your side is. And then we opened up 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and we just read it. And I said, both of you guys have a little bit of wrong here. We're not going to... We're not going to right now determine who's going to come out ahead in this situation because neither, neither of you come out ahead. You've both been wronged. But I asked him, I said, would you accept the judgment of a Christian? over the judgment of the world. And both of them agreed to. You know what happened? They just took care of it right there. Now I want to just tell you something. The situation was impossible. The same individual that had defrauded this person had defrauded other Christians. And never did resolve those same problems with them. But it was resolved because we decided no matter how costly we're just going to do it God's way because we care about the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what matters more than anything else. And you know something? It worked. And I want to conclude this morning with that as our conclusion. Get this. The reason God's way doesn't work is because you won't submit to it. Not because God doesn't have a better way. Most of the time, the things that won't work, oh, I couldn't do right, it's impossible. Friend, it is impossible because you won't do right. Not because you can't. You can always, with God's help, do the right thing. You can always obey God. You say, Pastor, if I did right in this situation, if I did what the Bible said in this situation, I'd have so many problems. Yeah, I know. I mean, you don't have any problems doing wrong. Think about that, would you? If I did right, I'd have so many problems. <laughs> Get yourself a doctor that tells you you're okay. Because that's what you're doing. Pastor, if I did right, I'd have to. And you know how much that could cost? You know what would happen if I did that? You're going to rule the world. The answer is yes, if you're saved. Then the simple answer is you can do right. Christian, I want to tell you something. It almost always is extremely costly to do right. It's never, it's right righteousness is not cheap. Righteousness costs Jesus his life's blood. It wasn't cheap. And for you to say that it's too costly for you to have the victory that's in Jesus Christ, you have cheapened the work of Christ in your salvation. That's what you're saying. You say, Pastor, oh, I'd never say that. No, friend, when you do wrong, that's what you say. And it doesn't matter what you say with your lips. It matters what you do in your heart. And I want to challenge you this morning. We're going to have an invitation in just a minute. And God's dealing with you specifically. Hey, and if he is, how about just committing to do right? Say, God, I'm going to do right. I'm going to find out what it is from the Word of God, and I'm going to do it. I'm going to rule the world someday, and if I can't figure out how to do right, 
how am I going to judge the unjust? You have a great deal of responsibility as a believer in Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, I ask you to bless and move in our invitation. Lord, I can't help but believe that this morning, based upon the Word of God, that there are individuals in this room that are faced with a choice. They've got to decide whether or not they will do what's right according to your Word. Lord, in many cases, be defrauded, be taken advantage of, be mistreated. And yet, Father, we know what your desire is. We know what your word plainly states. So, Lord, I just ask that your spirit would finish the work of conviction that you started by the preaching of your word. And I ask you'd show us plainly the situation and the scenario where we've got to do right. Lord, if it means to be defrauded, so be it. Help us to commit that to you. And, Lord, we know that you're able to meet our needs and to take care of us, so there's nothing that will be without if we do right. Help us to believe you at your word. And then, Father, more than that, I ask you to help us to commit to this truth as a church. Lord, help it never to be true that one believer would go before an unjust judge against another believer at Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church. Lord, help us just to be willing to just be taken advantage of, and just love and to forgive and be concerned about the spiritual well-being of the person more than we are about our personal wrong. We ask you to bless and move in our invitation. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to have an invitation at this time, and let me explain that if you're not familiar with the invitation in our church. Invitation is a time when we invite you to respond to the preaching of the Word of God. If you're here this morning and you've never received Jesus as your Savior, you don't fit in the category of those that will rule the world with Jesus, my friend. You fit in the category of those that will be judged by a righteous God. Because God has done everything that is necessary for you to receive Jesus as your Savior. He's done everything that's necessary for you to be just and justified, to be holy. Jesus died on the cross for your sin. You can't, by doing good works, make your sin go away. But by receiving the gift of the cross, what Jesus did when He died in your place, you can ask God for eternal life, for salvation, for the righteousness of Jesus. And God will give it to you for the asking. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you're not saved, if you haven't been saved from your sin, then this morning, that's the invitation for you. Receive Jesus. If you're here this morning and haven't received Jesus, would you just, uh, when, when others are standing and moving and praying and doing business with the Lord, would you just come forward and say, Pastor, I need to be saved. And maybe just look at me and nod. And if you're a lady, I'll have a lady open a Bible and show you from the Word of God how you can know without any uncertainty that you have eternal life and that you'll be saved forever. Here this morning in this matter of, of an unjust being... Uh, having matters against a Christian and going before an unjust judge maybe it's something you've never surrendered to the Lord before it could be that you're in a situation where nobody's wronged you but friend I want to say to you that that is a time limited factor because the day will come when you're wronged and you need to commit it to the Lord beforehand not afterward it might be that God's dealt with you about a particular sin or you've wronged someone else you've defrauded a brother it ought to be your desire to have the advantage over another Christian. It ought to be your desire to love a brother. If God's dealt with you about a matter, you know specifically what it is, and you know He wants you to do about it. He wants you to get it right. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Friend, if you confess your sin to a brother or fault to a brother or sister in Christ, then they have an obligation before Jesus to forgive you as well. And that's the invitation this morning. Take care of those matters that are preventing fellowship and harming the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. You stand to your feet. We're going to sing uh, page um, 222? No? 321. 321.